today on CityCast Denver. I grew up going to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's where I learned about dinosaurs and how the human body works. I also peeked at dioramas of Arctic wolves, cassowaries, manatees, and people. And that's what today's show is about. After 45 years, the DMNS is removing those dioramas depicting indigenous people, along with the rest of its North American Indian Cultures Hall. So earlier this week, me and producer Paul Caroli met up with some experts and went for one last tour to see those dioramas and have all the uncomfortable conversations about what a museum is and which stories these institutions choose to tell. Today is Thursday, June 15th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Uh, my name is Chris Petrella. I'm the curator of anthropology here at DMNS, uh, and we are about to walk into the North American Indian Cultures Hall, cool. which is closing very soon. Yes. How soon? Yeah, do we have a date? Uh, the last day that it will be open is June 15th, which is oh, Thursday. Oh, so this which is, week? Yes, it is closing this week. Wow. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Let's um, do it. Okay, let's go in. So the hall originally opened in 1978, and there have been uh, modest updates to it since then, but there are areas of it that remain largely unchanged. Um, and this is one of the newer areas of it where we have this film, which is actually, um, if you remember the commercial that the National uh, Congress of American Indians aired during the Super Bowl about changing the Washington football team's mascot. So this is a version of that, that kind of, you know, interacts with this map of North America in front of this display of moccasins from various uh, tribal nations in North America. So this is new-ish, but I think there are still, you know, significant areas of the entire space that need to be completely rethought. Um, so yeah. Teacher, doctor, soldier, Seminole. Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Paul and I are white folks. There's no way we could understand how this exhibit comes off to indigenous people. So we invited along Josh Emerson. He's a comedian and a member of the Denver American Indian Commission. Joshua, can I ask you how you feel when you walk in here? Uh, it's, it's definitely interesting. So I heard Navajo as we walked in. Uh, so it's cool to hear my language, like in a place like this. I the moccasins, I I didn't quite like pick up. Like I I can see like they're from. I I guess there's other things you could have used instead of moccasins, but but this. Uh, it, like right, this isn't the part that bugs me. It's it's the later part that, sure. that yeah, sure, exactly. Sure. So, but the moccasins, I think, you know, one of the things that a display such as this does is it kind of makes it seem like all moccasins are created the same way, and there's very culturally specific right. ways of not only designing and decorating moccasins. There's different terms used for footwear. Not everybody calls them moccasins. In fact, moccasin is a, an imposed term. Um, and even this, which is relatively new, is also a little bit challenging for those reasons. We knew going into this tour that some of the most problematic aspects of the hall were the dioramas depicting humans. So when we saw the first one, everyone had a lot to say. Yeah, so I'm Dene. I'm Navajo. I'm Claw Ship, born for the Bilagana. For me, especially this image right here. Um, the woman weaving. The woman weaving right here on the rug. I, that's, some people still still dress like that. Um, there, there's a lot of traditional aspects to what she's wearing. And for Dene culture, everything is so intentional with like the Sieth, that's like the, the hair bun and like the way she's like wearing her earrings. But there's also like a sense of like, you know, I was I was at the NBA championship game last night, and so the idea that the Ned people live in a modern context, that's always been like the biggest thing. Is that this is 
like a part of our heritage like all of this but you like even this like um like beautiful jewelry over here del galito he's the one that brought it to the to the navajo it's adapted from another culture even weaving in the first place we adapted from another culture uh, navajos are very adaptive um to the world around them and continue to be um uh, as a part of our identity and so at least that's the way that's uh that's something that i take uh personally and so that that i think um uh, when i first came because i came in here with uh with some of my friends and walking in here that that was what was most striking in terms of like seeing a version of my culture but uh it's also just a a, a part of it you know what i mean and not even like the full story and not uh, contextualized in a contemporary context and that's very really important to me because indigenous issues like there are supreme court cases that are being decided this month that are going to affect what sovereignty is and we need um like empathy and support and also people just to know our issues yeah. in a modern modern way and and I think creating spaces where people can speak about their own experiences rather than an institution telling people what is or isn't important about a cultural practice, I think, is critical moving forward, right? So you don't hear very much from Dine people in this section. Um, it's a, sort of impo- it's an imposed narrative from the institution. Also, that door should be facing east to greet the song. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It felt like every display we walked past, either Chris or Josh would point out some detail, like that wrong facing door or some major missing piece of context. And that's kind of how Chris described why they're closing this hall, too. He said that there were, quote, significant and pervasive problems related to conservation, design, contextualization and interpretation. In other words, everything a museum is supposed to do. Um, I mean, I think if if you wanted to boil it down to one thing is that the community collaboration that went into this in 1978 at the time may have constituted best practices for collaboration, but a lot has changed since 1978. And, you know, I think that responding, not only responding to best practices today, but hopefully um, being a place where new best practices are formed. So not only are we responding to them, but in some modest way, contributing to new ways of forming relationships and collaborating and co-creating uh, in the future, I think is the, the ultimate goal. But I don't think there's any one thing that you can point to that's, you know, underlying it all. I mean, I think it's it's sort of, you know, it's time, it's 45 years. That's a long time for mm-hmm. even a permanent ex- exhibition hall to be open. In those 45 years, millions of people like you and me have come through this hall and absorbed this problematic message. But perhaps the most complicated thing here is the diorama depicting a Cheyenne family living on the banks of Sand Creek. It's a landscape that would feel familiar to all Denverites. High plains, cottonwoods, mountains in the background. Um, Josh, I can you just... How do you feel when you walk into a museum and see this diorama? Um... There, there's a sense that uh, they're trapped in time, right? And there's a, there's like a real like sadness about that. Um, the braids are tight. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. yeah. Tight braids means good morals. That's what I was always taught. Uh, and, and especially because uh, she looks so happy, right? Um, and 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 he looks so happy, you know, as, as they're playing this game, and but it's also, it's also I like I like, there's so much context to being indigenous, uh, to being Cheyenne, and the fact that we're in Denver, uh, yeah, the confluence, it's not too far away, it's sacred, and that there there are no sovereign lands around her. There's, it's for a reason, right? I, I, and just, it's so, it, it's definitely, um, especially because like Sand Creek, yeah, under the, there's a, under a peace treaty and it was elders and women. And so when you see like this and elders and women and, um, it's just not telling that story. Right. Right. And so like, this could have been at Sand Creek, yeah. you know? And then, then, then like the third regiment just rides in with a Gatling gun. And so, yeah. so it's, yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I guess complicated feelings. It is hard for me to like, sort of put into words, but uh, uh, 
a general sense of uneasiness about mm. it, especially just that they are sort of frozen. That's the thing that I struggle with too, is that it, I feel like it puts indigenous people in history and not in the present moment. Right. And it doesn't do that with other people in the museum. Um, but I know Chris, you are newer to this position um, at the museum. How did you, what did you think when you first saw this? Yeah, I thought it was outdated. And I think that there's been a long history within the fields of art history and anthropology rooted in community collaboration that has pretty much set the record straight about the problematic and fraught nature of dioramas in general. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that we absolutely need to address. And I think it would be great to continue working with the descendants of the people who worked on this diorama, as well as the people who are still living, who are in this diorama about what the next steps should look like. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to honor their voices and their perspectives on all of this as well. Like the people who were modeled, who these... Uh, yeah, who you know, made some of these things, who, who, yeah. who gave them to the museum for the diorama, what do they want to see happen to that stuff. Um, you know, I think that those are all important conversations to have. Yeah. And we've begun them, but, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of anybody, so... Sure. This episode is brought to you by Sol de Janeiro. At Sol de Janeiro, touch isn't just for screens. Physical connection is so essential to how we communicate, it's infused in everything we offer. Sense so irresistible, PDA is guaranteed. Textures are so luscious, skin is huggable. Get into a Sol de Janeiro state of mind. Receive 10% off on your first order on soldegenero.com, plus free shipping with the code soldegenero10. One of the things that just blew my mind came up when we were standing in front of a diorama depicting a Seminole family in Florida. We were talking about where all these materials in the displays came from, because it's not like museum employees went out and made some survey of indigenous people and collected a statistically accurate sampling of their lives and experiences. All the clothing, the animal hides, the jewelry, the weapons, and the kitchenware were collected by a wealthy New England couple named Mary and Frances Crane. They got the collecting bug in the 1950s, uh, started collecting uh, indigenous art and material culture uh, from primarily North America um, and decided to try and open up their own museum in Marathon, Florida. Um, Mm. And perhaps unsurprisingly, it, it didn't get the same traction uh, that they had hoped. So they decided to, through mutual connections, donate the collection to what was then called the Denver Museum of Natural History, now the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This conversation happening inside DMNS is part of a broader change in museums across the country, too. Chris told us that all this momentum towards better representation, curation, conservation, and collaboration related to Indigenous communities has really picked up in the last 12 months. And then in terms of the conversation picking up momentum, like have indigenous people been a part of that conversation? Sure. So really when I started, um, I kind of came into this process a little bit midstream, like maybe right after it started. We're working with a group of consultants uh, led by uh, Donna Christian. Um, and we basically wanted to answer two questions uh, or you know, a few questions, you know, what what do people like about the hall? What don't people like about the hall? And should we have a hall at all? So we did a number of listening sessions with indigenous youth, uh, you know, sort of school age kids, young professionals, elders, college students, mostly from uh, Metro State and some of the other, you know, sort of student groups in, in Denver. I mean, I think the big takeaway was it's important to have a hall Um, It's important for people to be able to learn this history, but to do it in a way that is inclusive of contemporary voices. Um, And I think that's kind of the basis, you know, uh, among many other things for the decision to uh, 
close the hall and completely reimagine it. Yeah, because like there's a image over here, right, uh, of Indian boarding school. I, oh, yeah. uh, that was my mom went to Indian boarding school. My all my uncles and aunts went to Indian boarding school, and the trauma that they suffered, like it affects my relationship with them now yeah. in terms of like how they understand, um, you know, co- like corporal punishment or even just their like own indigenous identity being like shamed for it or. Uh, punished for it um and, and so it's just it's it's i mean like i said like I'll, I'll say it over and over again we exist in a modern context and some of the traumas you know are hundreds and hundreds of years old but we i experience them and our generation experience them and like part of healing is acknowledging uh, and and um, part of like getting like a, a buy-in from non-natives that we that <laughs> all of this hurts it hurts and to not even like have it discussed, it it makes you crazy. It feels like you're being gaslit by mm-hmm. the people around you, especially at a culture institution where you're supposed to be able to learn, like uh, like when, when when this is what they're saying, this is what you should learn about natives. Mm-hmm. That's tough. It's tough. DMNS has shuttered the hall as of today, June fifteenth, and Chris says the next step is to start the deinstallation process, which is no small feat. Materials from more than one hundred and forty tribal nations are represented in the hall, so the institution will attempt to engage with all these communities to try to make sure the materials are conserved, exhibited, or repatriated in the right way. So it closes this week. Yep. Okay. Did no in no time set for when it will reopen, right? No. Not yet. Okay. No, no. I mean, I think one of the benefits of not having an opening date is that we can do this dialogically, right? And do it in conversation um, with people, even as we begin to deinstall um, and not letting an arbitrary timeline dictate the pace of that is actually an asset in this particular instance. And that that work that y'all are going to start to embark on is, I think not. I don't want to say radical because I think it's been it should have been started a long time ago. But it is really cool that it is starting. I guess and sort of finding out how you want to reimagine that with with native buy-in and and for the Denver community at all I'm really excited for you I guess I mean it's got to be such a great opportunity to sort of like contribute to a community in such a strong way yeah I mean that's the hope you know it is really exciting and it's exciting to be here at this particular moment in time and it's a huge uh, responsibility that you know we definitely don't take lightly and you know as you know we're we're we're, we very much think of this as the beginning of something and not the end of something Mm -hmm. so yeah i i you know and and josh i hope you continue to be (laughs) involved i hope this is uh the the start of continued involvement we would you know that'd be great donna's got my number (laughs) (laughs) awesome well thank you guys so much this was great And here's what else Denverites are talking about. Safe parking. Private parking lots designated for people living in their vehicles will become a permanent option in Denver after a vote by city council. Westward reports that like the Safe Outdoor Space program, the Safe Parking Initiative has proven to be an effective way to keep folks off the streets. A council committee also authorized an additional $600,000 in funding for the initiative, which would allow the program to greatly expand the number of people it helps. Speaking of outdoor places created during the pandemic, you can now enjoy that outdoor patio at your favorite restaurant forever. Denverite reports that City Council made the temporary outdoor dining program permanent and ushered in some new rules, including allowing businesses other than restaurants and bars to take part in this lower cost business expansion. The changes also offer less complex qualifications for what can be used as patio space, like private parking spaces, and have streamlined the application review and approval process for expanding a business's outdoor square footage. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell my friend Jill at the museum about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later.
to make a temporary pandemic-era private parking lot program that designates spaces for people. 